Ladies and gentlemen, George Talks Business is now beginning. Please hold as we launch the live stream. Good evening. I'm Anush Mehrotra, Dean of the School of Business at George Washington University, and I am delighted to open the fall season in the George Talks Business series, where our goal is to bring you conversations with interesting speakers on a weekly basis on a wide range of interesting topics. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guests who join us today, President LeBlanc, Vice President of Development and Alum Alumni Relations, Donna Arbide, School of Business Advisory Council, guests from the Learner Extended Family, and all students, alumni, faculty, staff, and friends of the school who are here or watching online. This session and all George Talks Business series in September are brought to you by the generous support of Steve Ross, a George Washington School of Business alum, class of 81. Thank you, Steve, for your generosity and sponsorship of the series. This gives us a unique opportunity to invite exceptional guests such as our speaker today. But before I introduce today's speaker, let me introduce our moderator. Dr. Lisa Delpinirotti is the director of the MS in Sport Prog Management program and an associate professor of sport management at the School of Business. She has been a professor of sport, event, and tourism management at GW for more than 28 years. Dr. Nelpi Nirotti has established a strong academic program at both the undergraduate and graduate level and has also helped develop the Sport Philanthropy Certificate, which serves to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of nonprofit organizations using sport for social good. She also directs the GW Green Sports Scorecard to help increase the sustainability of sports facilities, organizations, and events, and serves on the faculty of the International Olympic Committee's Executive Masters in Management of Sports Organization. In fact, she just returned yesterday from Switzerland and is planning to attend her 20th consecutive Olympic Games in Tokyo this summer with 28 GW students. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mark Lerner. Mark is a native Washingtonian and managing principal owner and vice chairman of the Washington Nationals Baseball Club. He is also a principal of Lerner Enterprises, the company founded by Mark's father, Ted Lerner, and is the largest private real estate developer in Washington, D.C. area. An enthusiastic sports fan since childhood, Mark also represents the Lerner, Cohen, and Tannenbaum families as a partner in Monumental Sport and Entertainment, the sports investment group that owns the 2018 NHL Stanley Cup champion Washington Capitals, NBA Washington Wizards, WNBA Washington Mystics, AFL champion Washington Valor, and Baltimore Brigade, and the Capital One Arena. Mr. Lerner and his family are leading philanthropists in the region supporting many organizations and causes. Mark holds numerous volunteer positions within the community, too many to list them all. He currently serves as the Council of Advisors of the Bender Jewish Community Center of the Greater Washington, a member of the board of the Washington DC Sports Hall of Fame, and a member of the board of the directors at Hillel at the George Washington University. We are honored to call Mark and the Lerner family our alumni and generous benefactors. They care deeply about this community. Their philanthropy to the university is marked by the health and wellness center that bears the learner name and serves as just one of many examples of learner's generosity and dedication to GW. Please join me in welcoming Mark Lerner. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Barotra. Um, I know George Washington would be so proud uh, to see baseball alive and well here in the nation's capital. I just wish George could win more of those races. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not fixed, Lisa. 
you know, for a while, it was, you know, Teddy's got to win it. You know, yeah. now he's winning a few. And, you know, can't you put in a little bit for George? We'll do. What, we'll do what we can. Okay. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight, and uh, thank you for all the questions you submitted online. Our discussion today will flow from off the field business to on the field player relations and uh, the future of baseball. So let's begin by better understanding why the Lerner family uh, was interested in investing in baseball uh, here in Washington, D.C. Well, I don't know, it became the Lerner family. I think it was more my, my dad and I in the beginning. Um, I've been a sports fanatic since I was a young boy and uh, into a grown man. And um, I really, it's, uh, since a, uh, probably a, about eight years old, I've always said to my father, I said, why don't we get one of those teams? And, so, <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, they cost some money, son, you'll learn as you get older. And when the senators left Washington to become the Texas Rangers in 1971, um, we were obviously devastated that that could happen. And certainly we didn't know, have any clue that it was going to take 33 years to get baseball back in Washington. And we were determined to get a team. It's our hometown. We felt it important that the national pastime be represented here. And who knew we were going to take this long? Finally, in 2005, Major League Baseball made the final decision to sell the, the Montreal Expos, which they controlled at that point in time. And we went through the process. And before we went through the process, we had a meeting with our entire family. And it only took one person to stop us from moving ahead. It had to be unanimous. And um, that happened. And we turned out, it turned out that we were the only family who actually went after the team, which was to our benefit, because Commissioner Selig at that point was very much a family kind of guy. Uh, he, he grew up with the Fetzers of Detroit and um, other uh, families in the baseball community. And he really felt that it was important to have family where there was succession involved. He certainly had to have the means, but he wanted, uh, he wanted succession to be a major part of this, that there wouldn't be a question who would take over when it was time to move on to somebody else. And um, we were that choice. And, uh, we did what we were supposed to do. We, we kept our mouths shut during the process. And it was, uh, it was you know, every morning you picked up the paper to see you know, who did what and who was, all these rumors about who was taking the lead. But in the end of the day, thank goodness we got it. And we were officially named the owners of the team in May of 2006. And we took over in uh, July of 2006. So it's been an incredible ride and one that it's, uh, changed our family. We're very much a private family, still are, but we've been, we felt it was an opportunity to do some wonderful things for the community. For most people, sports is a pas you know, a passion, a pastime. Excellent. For those of us who work in it, it's a business. So please share with us some of the lessons you learned from uh, running a successful real estate company and how does that translate to running a baseball team? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, they're not as different as you think. Uh, if you go back to when we took over the team, we knew we had a great business organization, develop and management company, and that we would be able to take w what we do very well at Learner Enterprises and use it to make the Nationals a great organization. Um, in 2007 and 2008, when Nationals Park was under construction, we were able to use our development skills, and since then, our management skills in running the, the finished product to bring the, uh, the development in on time and on budget. Um, we, uh, we're, I think we made a significant impact on what, was eventually, what eventually became Nationals Park. There were some things that the city took out that we put back in with our own funds, and uh, we, we believe that we created one of the great parks in America. Um, it's, it's, and I, th I think that you'll find through a lot of my comments that there's, there's, a, there's a similarity in so much that we do. We, we, you know, we have a, a saying at the Nationals about accountability, performance, and excellence. 
it's no different than the things we do at Learner Enterprises. It's just you have a lot more eyeballs looking at you in the, in, in the sports world. But it is, it's important that um, you always strive for excellence. That's, I'm, I'm very picky. My dad's very picky about the way we want things done. Now that my sons are in the business, I've hopefully, there's a little bit of osmosis there. Um, but uh, we're, we, we've, we've, we've learned a lot through this process. And uh, I believe that it, we've really found that, that balance between the two. I remember early on talking to you about this, and you said it's a, a like real estate that may have, you know, five o'clock or six o'clock, you shut the door. Sports is a 24 seven business. Oh, it's, it sure is. And you know, it used to be I would go home and have a nice dinner and watch a ball game. Now I got, I, I you know, finished my regular day up in Rockville and then end up here. And some days you don't get home until 11 o'clock. At least that's the way it used to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's consuming. Um, don't be around me when we lose. <laughs> I, I uh, don't watch Sports Center. I don't watch the replays. It is, it is a tough, tough business when you're, pa you're passionate about it, and uh, we are passionate about it. There's nothing more that I want is to put a ring on my father's hand. And uh, that's, been, that's been my passion for, uh, since we bought the team in 2006. I think you, we can all agree that that's something that we all want to. So uh, bring it home. <laughs> We're trying. Um, how involved are the other partners in your organization? Well, uh, thank goodness my, my dad and mom are uh, here and, and well. And uh, they're, my dad is definitely involved in still in most aspects of the business, both the business end of it and the bis baseball ops end of it. He's, our entire family is involved in every major decision whether it's hiring a, a new manager or a, signing a major free agent, we're all a part of those decisions. So my sister Marla, who has a, ch a large role, who is the chair of the Washington Nationals Dream Foundation and also our family foundation, has done a magnificent job in our outreach with the community. We have a, a state-of-the-art business uh, baseball academy in Ward 7, Anacostia near Fort DuPont which we're very proud of, and Commissioner Manford has said it's the finest of its kind in the United States. So we're very proud of that and all our community uh, relations and uh, involvement in, out in the community. So you kind of touched on this, but what is the most challenging aspect of owning a team? Um, challenging, I think it's that you, it's, one, it's, tough, it's, it's tough enough getting up in the morning and wanting to build the best project you, ha you have or having a project look the best way or deciding whether you should buy a piece of land or not. You know, we're tough on ourselves. But when you have tens of thousands of eyeballs on you, and not just eyeballs, sending you comments about <laughs> you're doing this wrong, why did, it, why, did it, why did Davey take this guy out and bring in another guy, and you know, why did, what's your general manager thinking? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's tough, it's tough, and you just, we, we, we started this thing with an idea on how we wanted this to run. You can't, you can't get all consumed with that. If you're doing, trying to do things the right way, in the end of the day, that's, 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 that will win out. But it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an easy world. <laughs> so what's the most rewarding? Um, I think a couple things. One, uh, certainly our community involvement uh, is something we've always wanted to increase. Um, as I mentioned, Marl has uh, done an incredible job in her stewardship of our foundation, but uh, also our outreach with the military. We have had a special relationship with the military since uh, the day after we bought the team. We invite military uh, vets and their families to join us as our guests, which has led to so many other things that we do with the military. This past uh, Saturday night, we had the honor of hosting the first championship game of the uh, military softball championship, which is all the bases in and around the Washington area. It was like 150 teams, came down to two, and we had a great crowd out there it's a, for first year. And, uh, but we, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. They do so much for us. We can't do enough for them. They love, they love what we do, they think it's a big deal. To us, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's the, the least we can do. But we, 
that to me, that's the best part of what we do is our relationship with the military. It's very special to my wife, Judy, and myself. Great. Well, thank you for doing that, too. Uh, with the statistics showing that, uh, that the baseball fan base is aging, um, what are the Nationals doing to engage young, a younger audience? Well, since the first day we, we owned a team, our approach was to um, try to build a family-oriented uh, experience at the ballpark. Uh, we started at day one knowing that the, the nine, eight, seven-year-olds are now, you know, all driving, bringing their girlfriends, their wives, whatever, their families, and we knew that was the only way to build a fan base out of nothing. I mean, 33 years, there was baseball fans, but they didn't have a loyalty, and even though it's a very transient population here, there was nothing to hang your hat on. And we felt that that was the best way for the future to build a fan base from nothing, to engage the families. And we've been very successful. And over the years, it's been fun to watch the kids come and the, fa and the parents come. And you know, first, they you know, didn't have Nationals hats. Now they're wearing the hats and the shirts. And it's great. One of the fun things is still standing out at Centerfield Gate when the fans are coming in and watch how it's changed over the years, and I get a big thrill out of that. If some of you are not aware, they started a new program this season, uh, Kids Eat Free, which uh, many of my friends appreciate. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a great uh, opportunity too. Well, it's been very successful, and, 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 and along with that, we, we've really tried to get our young players, like the Sotos and Robuses and Turners of the world, more engaged with the community. Uh, Sean Lowell does a magnificent job among other, uh, many of our players in the reading program that we have in the community. So it's, we, we, can, we can do a lot. We, have, uh, we clothe about, I would say, 50% of the teams in the Washington area now, Little League, um, where our goal is one day, hopefully have 100%, and they all wear Nationals garb, which is great. And, um, uh, so it's, there's many ways that we can t touch our community. I, I think one of the great statistics that are out now is that youth baseball has actually um, the most popular youth uh, um, sport now. It is ex it's exceeding soccer and, uh, and other youth sports that are out there, including f and football. So we're, we're excited about that. We think we're, we're making a difference. And, when you're at our games, uh, it's great to see that there's a lot of youth there and it's fun to watch them. The, one of the fun things, and it's the simplest, the cheapest thing we do is Sunday run the bases. And the thousands of kids that come to the game just for that, uh, it, it's amazing. So uh, we have a, we, it's, it's fun to watch the kids. I'm, you know, I love watching my kids grow up around it. And now I can watch my grandsons grow up around it soon. And uh, they've got their special jackets that their mother, their grandmother made them with a curly W on it. So. Nice. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we believe that uh, we, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's just as important as putting a good team on the field as it is touching both military and have other community programs that, that make a difference. Right. But we all know wins and losses plays a big role <clears throat> in the team business success. Uh, with the, what's the national strategy to keep the team leading contender? Well, when, I think it goes back to our philosophy when we, we bought the franchise. Um, it was our, we, you know, we'd love to have won the World Series that first year, but that's not the way that it, was, it's, it was written up to be. We felt that the first thing we had to do before we even thought about free agency was to um, really work on our, uh, building up our minor league program. We were giving a franchise that was less than quality than an expansion team. We had to fill 22 spots on a AAA roster just to compete the first year. And the team wasn't much better than a AAA team. And they left us no minor league talent to speak of. So we've had to start from the beginning. We felt that it was important to um, it really build up the system, get the right scouts, get the right facilities, um, 
spend our money wisely. And at some point in time, which eventually was our first major signing of Jason Worth, that we, they, we dip our toes into the free agent world. But we still take that approach now, even though our payroll has probably gotten a little bit of out of hand because of our desire to win. And that'll have to change a little bit as the years come on. But you know, at, at the end of the day, you, you, you got to have great patience in this. And no matter how much you want to win, you got to be smart about it. It's still a business, has some cool perks, but it's still a business and it has to be run properly. Well, the Nationals currently have three of the top MLB pitchers. Was that strategic or luck? Well, uh, my, 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 I remember my father's little voice says, it's all down to pitching, pitching, pitching. And that's always been uh, our goal to have a uh, you know, a great starting pitching staff. Um, we've been very lucky over the years since um, Stephen came in 2009 that um, we were able to attract great talent. And when we signed Max Scherzer in 2015 uh, and then Patrick Corbin this past December, we just added to that. And when you go into the playoffs, it's, you know, you're starting from scratch, it's zero to zero. And most of the time it's great pitching it wins the, wins the day. And if you can hit steadily through the playoffs with the, with the kind of pitching we have, uh, we got as good a chance as anybody. So that's always been our philosophy. We've, we've got five really solid pitchers right now, a couple that are up here uh, pitching this month on top of that. So we're, we're, we have a good inventory for the next few years to come. So hopefully if no, nothing changes dramatically, uh, we, we will continue to invest in starting pitching. And your pitchers can do more than just pitch. Yeah, we've been, we've actually, uh, Max Scherzer, who is the ultimate competitor, is just, uh, he goes crazy on the bases. And uh, he, wants, he wants to go out there and, uh, and steal bases. And we, you know, he says, are you nuts? You know, so, but sometimes he just can't stop me. He went out the last week, was running around like, like somebody was running after him. So uh, no, he's, he's uh, they're all three of them, Stephen, Max, and Patrick, all real good athletes. And they've, they've all contributed uh, offensively this year in meaningful ways. So what factors do you consider during contract negotiations with superstar players like Bryce um, Harper? Mm -hmm. And when do you say no to re-signing? Well, it's a lot more than just the, the, the business part of it and the financial part of it. You're looking at character and you're looking at their health, how they'll work into the clubhouse. Um, we did our best to save Bryce. Um, he had something else in mind, and that's why they call it free agency. It's not our choice. We can only put a great offer on the table. Doesn't mean they have to take it. And, um, but it, there's, there's a lot goes into it, and, but you, you know, as long as you have to tie these fellows up, uh, you've gotta make sure that they're, they're the right people and um, if you get one, it's a bad apple. It can, it can be a cancer in the clubhouse, and we're not, we, we're, we're not going to let that happen. And do you personally meet with the players? Uh, I not too many. I've met, I met Stephen ahead of time, who then obviously was in the draft. But uh, Patrick Corbin was one that I spent a lot of time with, and actually uh, had dinner with him and uh, with Mike Rizzo, and we were able to convince Patrick to come and be a national and. It was, it, that was a lot of fun. He was a great young man and uh, had an had a, had a interesting evening with him. And I think it, hopefully it made a difference in his choosing to come here. He's, he's, uh, I don't think he's hit his prime yet. I think he's going to be a great asset for years to come. Being a lifelong fan, uh, it was way before uh, cybernetics and um, all the data analytics. Uh, so where do you think data plays a role in compared to old school methods of team management? Well, I think, I mean, you, we're inundated with data now. Um, I think as far as the national is concerned, we have to find a better balance between the analytics and good old scouts and their eyeballs out in, out, out in, in around the country and in Dominican and Venezuela and other countries. So um, a lot of people have gone much more towards analytics. I personally like the balance, um, but we need to do a better job of it, and we would plan to invest a lot of money this off season to take ourselves to a higher level on analytics. Um, although 
collective bargaining agreement does not end until 2021. MLB has already started to make some changes. Any predict prediction about other changes that may take place in the next CBA? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a touchy, touchy subject. All I can say is I, I believe that both the baseball owners and the commissioner and the players um, don't want this to go on for very long. I mean, we've been through that in 1994 with the strike. That's not something any of us want to see again. Uh, I was experienced as a fan, not as an owner then, but uh, it's, not, it's not a good situation for anybody to be in. And uh, we only hope that, uh, that everybody handles it in a professional manner and has the goal of uh, getting this buttoned up before uh, it goes too far and becomes an issue. But I, I'm, I think the, the commissioner with his labor background has his arms well around this. And uh, I think in next year when the negotiations start going on that uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll be in good hands. Is there anything that you would like to see changed? I don't think you have enough time. Um, oh, we have plenty of time. No, um, the commissioner doesn't like to see me too often because I'm always barking in his ear, but I think the number one thing I like to see changed is the schedule. I think that's the one that hurts us the most at, from a revenue standpoint and from the, the players and the travel and everything else. On the revenue, it's a terrible schedule. When we have to play teams like the Marlins 18 or 19 times and other teams within our National League East that kind of that many times, it, it's, it's boring. And I think that there, there's a way for, with realignment to improve that dramatically. And I hope that that is part of what is agreed to in the next year uh, through the collective bargaining arrangement. Um, and uh, that, number two, I would think, if my top two or three, uh, would be uh, the umpiring. And what I mean, I, we have the ability now, we're very close to having the ability to techno technologically to um, do the balls and strikes electronically. And I'm very much in favor of that. They're, they're working on it, they're making great progress. It's been tried this summer in the South Atlantic League with great success. There's a few things the commissioner was explaining to us. We had an owner's meeting here last week in Washington that they have to work on. But I, I see that happening at some point. I hope it happens because there's nothing more frustrating than watching that little box on the TV and see how much an ump has, has, you know, has made a mistake by. So it's, it's very frustrating. Um, and the, my friends who watch games with me, those are the two things that come up. You know, is who we're we playing, and the umpiring. There's many other issues that have to, have to be addressed. So there, travel, for instance, uh, getaway days are very difficult. Um, you know, there's no there's no rules now. For example, to, in the last few weeks, we played at Pittsburgh a night game on Wednesday night and had to play a 2:20 game in Chicago the next day. So we get in the crack of dawn. It just happened again the other night when we played a game and. Um, in Minnesota, which ran late because of weather, our guys landed at 7 o'clock in the morning and had to play a game that night. Man, it, it takes its toll. There's more chances of injuries. Uh, there's so many factors that, that, uh, and, and issues that can, comes out of it. So I'm hoping as part of solving that problem and solving the scheduling problem, it may even come to the going back to 154 games maybe starting the season a little bit later, having a few more off days for these guys to catch your breath. I think we have one off day now for the rest of the season. It's, it's brutal, and it, even with the expanded rosters, it takes a major toll on your players, and you see it on the field. They, some of those nights, they look dead on their feet, and it happens with all the teams, not just us. So it's, it's a very, very long season, and I think there's got to be ways, and I know the commissioner's considering many ways to come up with some unique things to make it more exciting during the season and possibly make some other changes over time that uh, will, will make the, the schedule more interesting. I think the health and wellness of athletes across all sports, whether it's collegiate, you know, youth, collegiate, pros, is um, a top topic that I know we're discussing yes. inside the classroom as mm -hmm. well. So uh, another trend or 
something that's coming to DC is sports gambling. Um, how is this going to change the ballpark experience? Well, um, as you may have read, you know, there is going to be an entertainment center that the Nationals are going to develop on First Street right next to the stadium. And we're trying to figure out now how do you keep the family atmosphere here inside the park, yet outside the park you have sports gambling. And um, it's, not, it's not the easiest thing in the world. We have a little time to still figure it out, but uh, we're going to build a state-of-the-art facility, uh, hopefully starting in the next year or so. And um, we're still going through our approval process, but it's definitely a tough one. Uh, and we're not the only ones who have to deal with it. It'll be interesting to see how Monumental Sports deals with it inside that, their building uh, where the green tour used to be on 6th and F. And um, they, they're doing multiple levels. So we see what issues they run into, things we can learn from them before we even open the doors of our facility. Do you see in-game betting helping with attendance? Well, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work. I don't know if it'll help with attendance or not. It just, it's just, an, you know, people have so many different things they can spend their money on these days. It just gives you another reason to go down there. That experience is just for the 81 national games a year. It's a reason to come to the Capitol Riverfront area, which has become a di dynamic neighborhood, one of the top five new neighborhoods in the country, as pointed out by Forbes magazine. And it's just another reason to come down there and take what was just 13 years ago, one of the worst neighborhoods in America and change it into something that it, we all could be proud of. So it's, it, it's, there's a lot of good things that can come out of all this. I remember being at those uh, city council meetings uh, many years ago, <laughs> uh, trying to explain to them the opportunity that a baseball um, mm -hmm. ballpark can do. Yeah, well, there, was a, there were a lot of naysayers for sure. Um, I think the, the ones, you'll find many that even voted no against it back then will say it's one of the great things that happened to the city. And uh, it's amazing what a ballpark can, can do for your city. Look at so many communities around the country that have put uh, great ballparks in tough areas and made them into little jewels within the, within the community. So we're very proud of what we've accomplished. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, there's always eight, nine, ten cranes in the air in our neighborhood. It's amazing to watch what has been accomplished it's really since the end of the recession in like 2010. It's amazing how many buildings have gone up in our neighborhood. And I know you're a partner in one of the other, you know, uh, in another sports ownership group, but do you view the other sports teams as competitors? No, just the opposite, really. Um, we're all better off if, if all of us are winning. And uh, it's, it's make Washington a great sports town. Um, I can't sit there and root against anybody else. I'm, uh, obviously, I'm a partner in the Wizards, Caps, and Mystics and, and Monumental Group. So I was just as thrilled for Ted when he, when he won the Stanley Cup as I, he would be for me if we won the World Series. And he's been uh, a great partner, a great friend, and Wish him nothing but the best, and the same goes with for the other teams in the area, including the Redskins. We, it's good, it's good if everybody's playing well, winning titles, winning divisions, and it's uh, it's good for the community. And kind of going back, uh, you were gracious enough to allow some GW students and I to go down to Dominican Republic and visit the academy down there. Um, where do you see? You didn't your return internet? my suntan lotion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where do you see the international players uh, fitting in with baseball, not only now, but in the future? Well, I think at some point in time, they, there's got to be an international draft. It's, uh, a lot of people describe what goes on down there as the Wild West, and it's every bit of that. Uh, between um, the agents down there and all the influences they have on these players, it's really... Uh, not a good situation, and it would be best for everybody, in my opinion, that it would be that draft either become part of the regular major league draft or a separate draft for just players down in the Caribbean area, you know, the Far East, uh, and all over the world. So um, uh, it's important that we do do more down there to make it a better situation, including including the Cuba situation too.
Do you see that happening in the next CBA? I hope so. I think it's uh, one of the items of many on the commissioner's list. Um, it would be the best thing for everybody that uh, we all put our heads together to find out the, a better way to do this because it, uh, it, you know, there are a few teams that you know, have the money spent, but there are caps on how much you can spend now. It isn't like you can just keep writing checks. So it is getting to the point where it would be relatively easy, in my, in my opinion, to get this under control and um, have a, a better system. A couple of years ago, you opened uh, spring training, a new spring training facility. Uh, how's that going for you? Oh, it, it came out beautifully. Uh, very proud of it. Uh, there's nothing I like more than fiddling with stadiums. You know. <laughs> Nationals Park is my baby, and that was uh, a fun thing to do. I love going and visiting new ballparks and had the opportunity to visit many spring training facilities and minor league uh, facilities around the country. and. Uh, Actually, uh, we used an architect in Phoenix who did the what's a place called Salt River Field, which I consider the nicest in both Arizona and Florida. And I think we created with the Astros a masterpiece for Florida. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it has every, every button that you can push. And it's, I think the, the, actually the clubhouse may be nicer than the one we have in Nationals Park, which is pretty damn nice. <laughs> so uh, no, they, we've given them every reason to it's a great way to attract players to come to your organization. They know we treat them in a first-class manner. And this is just another thing to add to it, that we have just an incredible facility. Plus, we use it 12 months a year. We send players down there to rehab. It's not just you know, the six weeks of spring training. It's a lot more than that. And it impacts that community as well. Very much so. So we're just about ready to open the questions up to the audience. So get your questions ready. Um, but we're going to close, since we have many students in the audience today. What advice can you give to college students today uh, on business or on entering the sports business? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's just entering the sports business because it's a tough business to get into. I mean, I've heard many stories and you know, I, I started just you know, give, giving water to the players and now I'm assistant general manager. You know, you, you're gonna start at the bottom in the sports business, but just in business in general, um, I'm, I'm a very lucky guy. I, development and designing and building buildings is still my number one passion. And my number two passion is sports. I got to do them both. But find something that you're passionate about. And the other thing that is, is really important and just does wonders for every, everybody is you have the opportunity to give back to your community. It's been a, a wonderful thing for our family. We've always been generous, but to t we've t been able to take it to a much higher level with owning the Nationals. And it's, uh, it's one the, again, as I said before, it's one of the best things we do. Great. Okay. I think we are now ready to open up for questions from the audience. Any questions? I have more. <laughs> yes, Lewis. I think a microphone's coming your way. How are you all? Uh, my name is Lewis, uh, recent graduate to um, work for the Washington Wizards now, so uh, not your not too distant neighbor. Um, want to get your input on, you know, being in sports, uh, a lot of it is about teamwork, fighting through adversity. Um, the Wizards are not projected to have a great season, you know, record-wise. What would be, you know, if you were put into in that position, a leadership role, what would your message or philosophy be to your, to your employees? Well, I, I think what you've seen since the end of the Wizards past season, that uh, Mr. Leonsis took a long time to figure out what's the best way to take the Wizards into the future. I give him a lot of credit. He was very patient about it. Um, I wouldn't change much of the way he's approached it to find out what the new ways are to approach building an organization, building a team. Um, and uh, I think that he's on the right track with the changes he's made this off season. The, the, the old way of building teams is is you know out the door now, and every, everybody has to look at it through 
fish, fresh pair of glasses. I think that he is a, is a visionary, and I think that the way he's approached it, um, we'll get the Wizards to the level of where he's taking the Capitals, hopefully in the near future. And I should say that if you have a question, I think uh, they would like you to come around and go to the microphone over there. So if you wouldn't mind standing up and walking over. Um, but if there is- I have the mic, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Princess. I'm a master's student in the Master's of Sports Management program, just started. Um, so I have a quick question for you in terms of the balance of baseball operations and how that's um, kind of shared between your family and Mike Rizzo. So when it comes to making those big decisions and getting players in or sending players out, how, what's the balance in the conversations between your decisions overall and Mike Rizzo's expertise? Well, we, we certainly listen to, to Mike. Um, it's, we think on, the, on these major acquisitions or major trades, it's important that we all be involved. Um, it, um, take some of the pressure off of him, that we're the ones saying yes and no to it. It's very few times, you count on one time over the years where we've said no to him. But we make him you know, earn his money and convince us why we should do this, this, or this. And uh, I think it's been a, a good, good, solid relationship in the way we've approached it. Sometimes you know, we can get on each other's nerves a little bit, but I don't have any problem doing that because I think it's, it's important to push him and push the staff to really make sure that we're doing the right thing. And uh, sometimes, after we put our heads together, we say, you know, and he agrees, maybe we should back off on this one. So it's, I think, I don't, I, th I think you'll find that most sports franchises, on decisions of this magnitude, uh, whether it's a major trade or a huge free agent signing or who the top person you're gonna pick in the draft is, um, the ownership gets involved. And I think it's, uh, it's foolish to believe that ownership isn't involved in a lot of franchises. I think they're involved in, in, uh, in the majority of them, not all of them, because there's too much money on the line. Uh, I have the mic. Uh, hey there, uh, Mr. Lerner. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Will. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the GW School of Business. And I just, I, I'm very curious, as an owner, but also as a fan, what has been the most difficult decision that you have had to make in terms of the Washington Nationals? <laughs> it's a tough one because uh, I, you know, I, I look at my role, I, I'm always a fan first, first of all. You, you can't be in this and not take the approach that if I was sitting in that guy's seat, you know, how do I want to be treated? So that's always been my personal approach since day one. The first meeting that I personally had when the, the afternoon we closed on, on the Nationals was with our ushers. And um, because they're the f first face that somebody sees when they come in and the last face they see going out. And over the years, we've gotten more great letters about our staff uh, than you can imagine. Um, and I, I, I just, I think that it's not just one thing. I think it's just the overall approach to the, 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 the way we, we want our fans to be treated. And even in our tough years when we're losing 100 games and the benefit of that, we got Strasburg and, and, uh, and Harper. But you didn't see people walking out with bags on their heads or anything else. They're treated in, in the right way. They get the right service. We hopefully, we, we provide everything you need. And when we get a letter from a fan saying they're unhappy about this or that. One thing is for sure, you're gonna hear back either on a phone call or in a letter, of whether we can do something or not do something, but it's the worst feeling in the world that you approach a sports organization and you get nothing but silence. That I cannot stand. And I knew that's one of the things that when we got involved that good or bad, we were going to respond to our fans. And some of the years when we haven't done very well, you know, you're going to get your complaints. And I'm sure if we don't win it this year, we'll get plenty of complaints too. That's part of it. But we're, not, we're never going to strive at any, anything but the best for our city and our franchise. And we, we're going to pursue excellence every step of the way. Hello, my name is Sammy Robb, and I'm a full-time MBA student. Uh, 
Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I had a question about uh, economics and real estate. Uh, you know, in looms of the talks about recession, changing rates in the industry, uh, I know this coming week we have talks whether it's going to drop. Um, where would you say the trends are going for real estate? I know that um, during the time of the recession, it could be 18 to 24 months. Where do you see the opportunity going for investments during this time in commercial and residential real estate? And which areas do you think will be the quickest to bounce back? And I'm not just talking you know, Northeast area, but the United States as a whole. Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, we happened to meet about five hours ago about this exact subject. Um, I, I personally see a recession coming. Um, I think that we have our issues like any other real estate company um, to make sure that um, where we s spend our money, we're doing it in a smart fashion. Every building we start, it's so difficult now to decide which one we're going to start at, because you have limited resources. It's not like the, 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 in, uh, long ago where you, know, you could finance everything. Now you're talking about just to start an office building, tens of millions of dollars of equity that are required or, uh, really help make the decision for you is even though we're doing many sets of working drawings now to prepare ourselves for the future and you never know when something's going to pop, some tenant comes along that wants to be, for example, at Tyson's 2, we want to be ready for them. But on the other hand, there's not, there are not many uh, buildings that we can build at once. We, we, all, we usually have one or two, you know, buildings that are under construction, a number of them in the pipeline, but it's, it's very difficult to, to, um, um, uh, to get, get a project started these days. Now to get back into you, your question, I think that um, hopefully our area is a good chance to bounce back as any area because of the federal government being here. And that's what brought us out of the recession in 2008 to 2010. We're very lucky to have that, even though their vision for what they want to do for the future GSA is changing. They're, they're reducing in size and uh, going to newer buildings where they can take, you know, 100, instead of 100,000 feet, they can take it 75,000 feet. Um, and they're taking a whole new look at the way they approach it. But our area has been pretty lucky over the years. And I would hope that, um, our, that the Washington area will stay strong, expect a little bump. Now, a little bump sometimes is good. Uh, construction prices have go gone out of control. Um, that has to be reeled back in. I mean, we just finished uh, uh, a pricing exercise, uh, bidding a building that we just started last week near the ballpark. And from the time we finished the preliminary plans to the time where we are now, prices have gone up like 13%. It's, I mean, by the time the ink's dry on the piece of paper for, for our budget, it's, you might as well throw it away and start over again. And that's frustrating. So maybe that'll stabilize a little bit. That's one of the good things that could come out of this, but we don't want it to last too long. Hello, my name is Victor and I'm a freshman. So my question was, um, how do you think the baseball industry would change if teams were allowed to purchase players instead of trading? Well, we, um, well, we, I guess we were in that. We're already there with free agency. Um, any any team can jump in on that, uh, but it's very expensive. Um, many teams in baseball don't go that route. Uh, they can't afford to go that route. Uh, we probably can't afford to go that route, but we've done it. Um, but we we are we are we are desperate to win, and we want a good. If we if we were in it just to have a team that. Made a couple bucks, and but we had to put a rotten product in the field. We wouldn't stay in this. Um, it's it's the passion uh, of our family to um, put the best product on the field every year. You're not going to be successful all the time, but we go into every season like we're going to go for a title, and and we're not we're not going to be satisfied until we 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 win one. But it's a free agency is a is a diff diff different kind of highway. And uh, it is, it can, there's a lot of pitfalls, and, but you have to be damn certain about what you, when you go in after a player that this is a guy that's gonna make a difference because you can't afford to make a mistake because 
You can't just say, okay, let's tear it up and go for the next guy. You're stuck. And most of these deals now are five, six, seven, eight, and is price signed for 13 years. And it's, it's, you, have to be, you have to be fully aware of that when you jump in. And a lot of teams just won't do it. It's the, 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 the market's too small or they're afraid of it. But to answer your question, anybody can purchase players. It's how you go about it. Hello, uh, my name is Sangmi Park. I'm an alum of the sport management program. I recently started the MBA program, and also I'm a staff member um, in the development office uh, for the athletics department here at GW. Um, I just had a question in regards to the globalization of baseball. Um, there's several international players within the league, and also recently um, the league also hosted a, a game in London. So I was wondering just what your intake on um, the globalization of baseball was, and also where you see it being headed in the future. Well, I'm, I'm all for anything that will increase the revenues of baseball. Um, I think the NBA, you know, reigns supreme in that. I, um, I think at, at some point in time, the NFL will put a team in London. At the success of this summer of the Yankees Red Sox series at Wembley Stadium was, or Olympic Stadium was amazing. Um, we're hoping to be able to do that in the next few years ourselves, be a participant in that, but I think it's, I think there's, you have to go for globalization. Um, there's, just, there's just not enough here uh, to, uh, and to be able to survive with the kind of numbers that are out there right now for players. You need, we need extra revenue to survive. And that's one of the ways. And I'm, I think at some point in time, you'll, you'll see some teams in Europe. It's not gonna happen overnight. And, uh, but I, I'm glad that the commissioner made that step and, and did the Red Sox Yank series because it was a phenomenal success. The lines were amazing. He told me he waited an hour just to get into the, into the, into the uh, team store there. Um, so uh, hopefully um, that will happen sooner or later. But, uh, I, but all the things that they're now implementing, not just overseas, but just like next year, is gonna, you're gonna have that really cool game in the Iowa cornfields near the Field of Dreams. Uh, you got more buzz about that than the World Series and something I wonder. <laughs> but uh, I told him to save me a couple of seats for that one. But uh, no, I, I think that that is, I think we have to come up with imaginative ways to make the, make the season a little bit more interesting. Not just to change the schedule, but have opportunities like that. Going to Williamsburg like the Pirates and Cubs just did. Anything that will spread the, the love of the game around, not just to the major cities, but all over the country is important. Thank you. I want to put a tip in. One of our alums that works for Major League Baseball International was responsible for organizing and putting that game on. So we're very proud of his work. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Edwin. I'm a freshman in the George Washington University. Um, I would actually like to learn uh, more about success. And my question is, um, what characteristics do you think a person should have if he or she wants to be ex as successful as you? Well, I'm, um, I think it's one word. You gotta be passionate. It's, that's, I love getting up on Monday mornings and going to work. When that ends, you know, yeah, that would be the end of it. But I, you know, I'm one of those guys. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy working, but I'm passionate about what I do. I am. Um, I, I, lo I love the, not only the process of building buildings, but I love what we're we're doing with our team, and keep making making it better. Not just what's on the field, but in the community. So all those things get my juices flowing every day. But when 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 there isn't passion. Uh, you, you, you better look for something else. <laughs> Thank you. We have a couple more. Hi, uh, my name is Alan. I'm a recent grad of the sports management program here at GW. So I think unlike uh, the other three major leagues in North America, baseball doesn't have a salary, salary cap. So I think as fans, we can see some teams even from b before the season starts, we can tell which teams are competitive and which teams are are not trying to win. So I guess from my question is that as a as an owner, do you think that contributes to, um, I guess, the disparity in baseball and the competitive com competitiveness? And do you think that's something you want um, maybe see change in the future? 
Well, in a way, there is a, a cap already. We don't really call it, call it that, but if you reach a certain right. salary level, you, you penalize severely for exceeding it. We've made it a point this, this year that we wouldn't go over it. Um, and it, it, the disparity in baseball is just because you're in some cities that are weak markets and they just can't afford to spend like some of the larger markets can. And then there's others that probably spend too, too much versus what their revenue levels are. So um, I think that um, it, like in any sport, you, 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 you shouldn't be in, the, in sports if you're not passionate about going out to win a, win a title. Um, and if you're just there to see the end of the year, we, we made a couple of bucks, but we're, you know, we're finished 20 games under 500. You know, that, I don't think that's what, at least I, I know that's what we don't want to be. We, we wouldn't stay in it if we, we had to take that approach to it. So, but I, I can't, uh, I can only worry about what the Nationals do and our family can only worry about what we do with the Nationals. And we're going to take the approach, but in a smart way, we hope to continue to put a great product on the field but be smart about the amount of money that can be spent. Hi, uh, my name's Ethan. I'm a sophomore studying sports management here. And I know you touched upon like families and stuff earlier when building up fan loyalty for the Nationals, but I just was wondering about some other strategies you guys have used to build up fan loyalty. And then also with the globalization of baseball, what are some things you guys are trying to do to build up loyalty for the Nationals on like an international level, get more people watching the Nationals specifically? Well, uh, as, as far as the, the Nationals are concerned, the, the, all we can do with our fans, in my opinion, a large part of it is be responsive to their, their needs and their requests. Um, again, if a fan has an issue, we want to be able to respond to them. Uh, we're always looking for, we, we're always um, checking ourselves secretly about what, the lines of the concession stands, the cleanliness of the building. We're, we, we, and that's our property management, I guess, and customer service background of what we do at Learner Enterprises. So we're, we have to be one step, step ahead of everybody. And if we're not, we need to react quickly to fans' needs, and that's the basic approach we take on everything we do there. And we, it's, we meet every week on the fan experience. And uh, we have a meeting every Thursday morning, and most of what we talk about is just that. So uh, we take it very seriously. And as far as the Nationals overseas, I think it's, we're in it with everybody else. I mean, the way baseball works, it's, it's one, you know, all for one and one for all. So. Uh, you know, you're going to have the, the great teams, the Yankees and the Cubs and the Dodgers that are going to have their loyalties that go way, way back. To, you know, and we hope that our presence in maybe one of these global games would you know, increase our, 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 our outreach to many places in the world where they don't know us right now. But we did get the word national. What's the, what's the, uh, the show on TV that shows Nationals Park? Um, the... the, the uh, the one that Kevin Spacey was in, <laughs> House of Cards. Yeah, that was pretty cool that we had National Spark in the, in the opening intro there. So, you know, I guess that, that's, that's our reach so far. <laughs> Great. I see we have three people and we have three minutes. So um, I'll hurry up. go ahead. Quickly. Uh, hi, I'm Jason. I'm a freshman in the School of Business. And I was just wondering, over the last two off seasons, we've seen the free, Asian period, free agency period kind of slow, where last year guys like Machado and Harper didn't sign almost well into spring training. What do you think is the reason for that, and how do you think that will affect your contract negotiations with Anthony Rendon at the end of the year? Um, I, do, I think a lot depends on what agent you have. I mean, every agent takes a different approach. Um, when we dealt with Patrick Corbin, it was a very short and sweet, like 10 days, start to finish. Um, other agents do things differently, and they stretch it out to get the last dollar. I, you know, every, it's, it's a whole mixed bag out there with that. Um, Anthony, we, we, we've stated many times, we love Anthony to death. He's been uh, our poster boy in a lot of ways. Not only is he a great player, but he's a great human being. He's been incredible in the community. And we're doing everything in our power to try to keep him as a Washington National. We've worked, it's got to be at least a year now with him to try to come to an agreement. We've given him an amazing offer. 
Uh, we hope he takes it. Um, but that's why they call it free agency, because it's not in our hands. All we can do is put the best offer we can on the table. We're, he knows we're serious about it. And then it's up to his wife and his family and him to make a decision. Thank you. Hi, my name's Taylor. I'm a senior here. Um, so you've mentioned community a lot and how much um, that aspect's really a big thing in sports. Um, so what was your original, um, when you owned, started owning the team, what was your um, kind of thought process through what you wanted this community to look like and how you wanted to use it to change um, just DC in general? Well, uh, as I mentioned, I think that one of the great things that has come out of of being an, an owner of a sports team in your hometown is the things that you can do in the community. And uh, uh, as I point out, the, our relationship with the military has been just an amazing one. Uh, I've learned so much. Um, and our families learned so much about being around these young, young people and the struggles they've gone through and their rehabilitation. Most of the ones we entertain are wounded warriors from Walter Reed, Fort Belvoir, and other places. So we've had um, a great relationship with a great relationship with, with that. And it, 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 that covers everything that we do. Is it, I think that's the number one special thing that's come out of all this. It's cool owning a sports team, but the, what you can do in the community that, that's lasting is what it's all about. Okay. And our last question, quickly. Hi, my name is Bailey Wise. I'm a senior in the School of Business, and I'm the president of the Sports Business Association and also a former Nationals intern. <laughs> um, so my question for you um, is baseball has received a lot of criticism compared to other leagues such as the NBA, whose players, personalities, and fame often transcend the sport. I know that the Nats are huge supporters of their players and their philanthropic efforts in the community. I wanted to know what are your suggestions for MLB in terms of marketing its players? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think that one of the things baseball has for it that maybe the NBA doesn't, even though their players are, their great players are in the forefront, I think that um, we, we, the ba baseball players, it's, it, it's a little bit different with baseball players. You know, they're just, you, you, you get the, the, the Harpers of the world and the ones who love the spotlight. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, it's great. He's energized baseball in a, a lot of good ways. But I think the, they're, the baseball players are a little bit more subdued. You get, you know, you get the ones that are a little bit crazy, but you know, it's, not, it's not like the NBA. The NBA is, you know, can, can be a little bit much sometimes. But uh, I, don't, I, I don't think there's, I think we're always trying to do unique things. We're trying to reach, uh, reach out to the young people, um, not only in, in the city, but uh, there's so many electronics now they can reach you. You've got to be one step ahead of them. And I think that's our greatest challenge in the future. How do we continue to build on and, and reach out to the, the new baseball fan or create the new baseball fan? That's one of the things I know baseball is very, very much into right now and trying to figure out how do we continue to do that? We've done it baby steps. We have a long way to go. Uh, we're looking to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all those great questions. And thank you, Mark, for My this great pleasure. talk. And uh, providing insight, a behind the scene look at being a professional sports team owner. Uh, we now want to encourage you to attend other George Talk sessions. Uh, next Monday, we have two of them. Uh, the first one is at noon for an interview with Nelson Carbonell, uh, Chair Emeritus, um, Emeritus of the GW Board of Trustees, and at 6 p.m. for a conversation with David Rubenstein, uh, co-founder and co-executive chairman, the Carlisle Group. Uh, the George Talks Business Series in September, again, is brought to you by Steve Ross, our GW alum. Thank you again, Steve, for the, the support. And we look forward to seeing you all then, in person or online. Uh, thank you again for coming this evening. <laughs>